Okay, perfect. Can everyone see the slides? Okay, so here's what I want to do is I want to go through these slides um, in, in, in a type of demo fashion. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be, thank you. Um, we're going to be switching in and out of these slides and um, the terminal. I'm gonna walk through setting up a project um, live and then uh, hopefully um, I'm, there would be more time left at the end and I can um, go around while you try and implement this yourself and I'll help anyone with any complications or any issues or any questions that you may have. So the first thing that we would do is after you install Git would be to configure some of these settings. And you would, you will find that in this Git config node over here in this flow chart. And so uh, Git is a version control software and it's meant to be used as a collaboration tool. And so in order for it to track changes and also know who made what changes, there are some variables that you need to configure such as the username, your email, and then there are some um, quality of life um, settings as well, like the editor that you'd like to use. The uh, default is, is Vim, and I would um, recommend to change that because it's not very um, user friendly. And so I, I would recommend using Nano VS Code. If you're on Windows, you can use Notepad. So I would change the Vim to that editor. And that would be, um, this would be, this line of code at the over here and you would select your editor so anywhere there are the great less than and greater than signs those are variables that you would have to input into the command and these commands will go into either git bash or they would go into the terminal in mac os and so after you configure your um your git user uh, configuration file you can view all of your configurations by running this command over here, the git config list command. And these are double hyphens. The longer hyphens are double hyphens. Okay, so. Jonathan, you said um, for editor, you would do nano instead of vim? Yeah, vim is. N-A-N-O. Yes, correct. Okay. And if, Thank if, you. Of course. And if you installed git bash for Windows, it would be one of the selectable items in the drop down for when you install it. On terminal, it should be uh, pre-installed and so you don't have to do anything. So if you're on a Mac OS. Okay, so I would like to start with going through this green portion where you would begin a new project. Um, and once, once you know how to go through this green portion, this orange portion will be easy. And you can, you can see that the difference is really uh, two steps and then you would join back into the green. And so first let's talk about some file structures. And so at CEDA, we use this type of file structure uh, where we put background information on the analysis in the background folder. And th so this can be literature review, um, consultations with the uh, investigator, stuff like that. In the code folder, that's where your scripts and notebooks would go in and you could place that in there. And then there's the data folder where you would have you would separate your raw data from your process data. And then you would have a results folder where you could have your disseminations, your reports, or uh, anything like that. And this isn't really anything that you would have to adhere to, but it would be, it's always a good idea to have a file structure that makes sense for your workflow. Uh, your workflow may be different if you're in software development versus in some type of analysis uh, framework. And so let's start by making this, um, directory here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, and you guys can see my terminal. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to move to the desktop. And so the CD command is, means change directory. So for, for people who don't uh, use terminal, CD stands for change directory. And what we're doing is we're changing directory from this home directory, which is uh, the tilde as a shortcut for the home directory. Um, and if you want to know what directory you're in, you can type present working directory, PWD, and that will give you the current directory that you're in. So I'm going to move into the desktop. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a folder and you could use the make dir command. And so the make dir means you make, you're making a directory. I'm going to call this git training. 
And so now if I show you all the files on my desktop, you can see that I've made a folder that is called Git training over here. And then the ls command will give you the list of folders on your um, desktop or in, in the present working directory. And you can clear this screen with a control L. Okay, so now let's change directory into the new directory that we created. And you can auto complete a lot of things by um, first typing a few characters and then hitting the tab button and it'll auto com complete. And so now you can enter. So now we're in our new folder, which is called the Git training folder. And so I wanna generate this, uh, uh, where, this file structure that we see in the image on the bottom left of the PowerPoint slide. And so I can go in ahead and do that. So we, we can make our background folder, the code folder, the data folder. We can make the results folder. And it's all the same command. And then if you wanna make a folder within a folder, you can just start at that folder and then we're going to be making a, a process data folder. And then we're going to be making a raw data folder. And if you hit the up arrow, you can go through the previously um, submitted commands so that you don't have to retype things over and over again. And so now let's look at the file structure. So we have a background folder, a folder, a code folder, data folder, and results folder. And if, if you, you can install a, a software called tree that'll show you um, the nested directories as well. And so this is now our working directory. Uh, and this is typically what we would use um, at CEDA. Okay, so we covered everything that's on this slide. So now we can go back to our flow chart. And so now I wanna talk about ignore files. And so what is an ignore file? We're going to be using uh, version control software to track files. And then uh, ideally you're going to be wanting to push your local files to a remote repository. So you have a local repository, which we will create in a, in a moment, and then you'll have a remote repository. And it's important that if you're working with sensitive data that you don't want to push any of that data um, to the remote repository. And so what you can do is generate something called an ignore file. And so you can tell Git what files you would like to ignore or what files within directories that you would like to ignore. So what I'm going to do before this is I'm gonna skip this step just to show you how um, things change after making the ignore file. So let's first initialize our local repository. So this happens here and it's just one command, the git init command. And so if we type git init, it says initialize empty git repository. And so what happens in here is if you do an ls to look at your file structure and you do an al, a stands for all files. So this will show you your hidden file folders as well. You can see that now there's a dot git folder. And in the OS language, when you have a dot before uh, the name of your folder, that means it's a hidden file. And so we have this directory and everything you end up tracking when you use git is, lives in that directory. But you uh, very you would ne you will never use this directory. You'll never you will never interact with it um, directly. You'll always be using the Git interface. Okay, so now we we've initialized our um, directory. So we can type in a Git status, and this will tell you the status. There's no commits yet, and there aren't any files to track because Git doesn't track folders; it, it tracks files. Um, so let's let's do this. Let's go into our let's uh, generate a data file, um, and so you can use the touch command to generate files to make a file. And we want to make a file in the data folder, and let's put it in the raw data, and let's call this data.csv. And so now, if I show you the working directory, we've created a CSV file in the raw data folder. And so now, when you do git status. You can, it'll tell you that there is a file in the data directory that it can track. It's telling you right now it's untracked. And if you wanna see the specific files, you can run a git status with the dash u command and that'll tell you what file it is. And so now there's this um, potential for error where you could potentially add this untracked file, commit it, and then push it to a repository. And that's where the git ignore uh, comes in. And so let me go back to the git ignore um, slide. And so let's generate a git ignore file. 
And so you would use a touch command because anytime you generate a file, you would use a touch command. Anytime you generate a directory, you would use the make dir command. And so we're just going to generate this git ignore file. Ignore. And so now what we want to do is we want to um, ignore anything that's within this data folder. And so what you can do is you can you can either the easy way would be to open the dot git ignore file with nano, and then you would type it in here, and then you can just save with the you can see the bottom here it tells you how to save so control o would be to write this file out and you hit enter to save it under the same file name and then control x to exit and so now if we do a git status you can see that this um, untracked file with the data no longer is tracked by git it, it ignored it which is what the git ignore file does and so now there's not that potential to uh, uh, add that file, track it, commit it, and then push it to a remote repository. And so there, the it is very useful to use a pre-made git ignore file and then customize that because there are a lot of files that are OS files that get generated in the background that you probably don't want to push. And these are things like the DS store in, in Mac that helps index the, the file structure within uh, your folders. And so I've, um, I've put in here in a link, a pre-generated .gitignore file that you can copy and paste into uh, your .ignore file. And then you can customize to add more um, um, files or folders that you would like to ignore. Another thing that you can do is you can set um, a, get, a, a .gitignore globally. And this means that you would set this file to be um, the, the git ignore file for all of your projects. And so if you're working at um, some institution where the file structure is always the same, so if you work at CEDA, for example, you would only have to generate this .git ignore once and it will um, be applied to all of your projects. And the instructions for that are here in the bottom. All right, so we've gone through, we've set up our file structure, we've made a git ignore file and it, we've initialized our uh, local repository. And so now let's talk about um, raw data and what schmod means. And so uh, schmod is a command that um, changes the file's um, accessibility rights. And so what we usually like to do for raw data is to make it a read-only file. And so what we do is we, we schmod 444 and 444 designates a read-only file. And what we do is the data and then the raw data star. Star means everything within the raw data is, is to be made read-only. And so when you execute this, and then you, you go into your raw data file, and you do an ls.l, you can see here, it tells you what the accessibility rights are. And so now this data.csv is only a read file, which means that you cannot make changes to this file. And so this prevents any accidental changes to raw data. What did you say the star did, Jonathan? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no worries at all. So the star means that every file, it's a wildcard asterisk, and it means that every file within the raw data folder becomes a read-only file. Okay. So let's talk Thank about- Thank you. And why do you want them all to be, why do you want them specifically right. like what's the benefit in read only versus? I mean, obviously you want, but like if we're collaborating with Git, does that mean right. so does that like affect it? Well, so the the reasoning for making raw data files read only is if if you you, you always want to have the ability to come back to the original data that, for example, was collected um, uh, through a machine or maybe it was collected on patients and you you end up processing that data, but maybe there's an issue with the processing. And maybe there's an issue um, somewhere downstream in your analysis. And you always want to be make sure that you don't make changes to the raw data, because if you go back to the raw data and reprocess, your end results will be changed. Does that oh, make sure. I see what you're saying? Okay, you're just saying that on the raw data, not on like the the, the output yes. files that you'd be collaborating on. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is branching. And branching is a little bit um, it's very useful for when you're collaborating with a lot of people. It's really more useful when you're in software development 
But I think that it is a best practice and it's something that you should uh, be doing when you're collaborating with others. And so what a branch is, is um, let's say you're working with a bunch of individuals on a project and this project for some reason needs to always be in a state where you can either write your markdown into a report or write your code into a report and someone needs to extract that report. And so you have this main development branch that you want to always be ready to generate a report. And so what you would do is you would branch off of that main development branch, make your changes, and then you would merge changes after everything is working in the order that you, you expect it to work. And that way the main branch is always ready while you, you add a code or analysis or any type of software, new software or features or anything uh, as you develop that in a separate branch. And so we can do this right now. So I'm back here in the terminal. And if you do a git branch, uh, that's not Let's create a branch first, maybe because I have to create a branch. So you can generate a branch. And let's call this um, demo one. Hmm. Oh, I see. I see, I see. You always want to make sure you're in the right um, directory. Um, so let's create a new branch. So git branch uh, method testing. Let's see, okay. Um, let's uh, let's commit this file here. So let's add the git ignore file. So when, once you add a file, um, it'll tell you that it's starting to track it. And then, uh, and this is, this is called the staging area. And the reason there's a staging area is for you to develop, um, uh, you can think of the staging area as a box and you put in the pieces that you want uh, to form a snapshot in time in the box. And so you would put them in a box in a logical way. And then once they're all in the, in the box, you can take a snapshot. And this is important because in the future, if you ever wanna go back to a previous uh, snapshot, um, then you would have that snapshot uh, set up in a logical way. And so right now I'm gonna commit this because I'm not sure why I'm not able to generate a branch. And so usually the first commit would be called an initial commit. And so we've made a command. Let me see if I can branch now. Okay. So I, I have to I have to generate the first commit to branch. And so now you can see that we have two branches. We have this main branch, and we have this new branch that I just generated, which is called a test branch. And so to start working in a different branch you would have to check out the, the branch. And so you would get checkout and then the branch name. And so it tells you that switch to branch and you can double check by running the branch again. And you can see that the asterisk is pointing to test. And so now we're on this um, uh, other branch. So let's, let's do something, let's create a file because we forgot to create a readme file for our repository, for our uh, local repository. So now we've generated this readme file and let's say we want to add some text into this file. So you can open up nano or you can open this file up and use word or whatever you prefer to use. And we can type something in, into the readme and usually the readme is a description of the project. And so I'm going to type, this is a good tutorial. And I'm going to save that and exit. And then I'm going to do a git status and you can see that this file is untracked but available and git knows that it's available because it's not being ignored. And so the flow of this would be to add the file and so you can add the file by using the git add command. 
And then what you can do, so we've put this in a box and now we want to take a snapshot of the box. Usually though, so this is only a tutorial. So that's, this isn't a, a logical way to make your snapshots. Um, you have to think about how you're making your commits because in the future, these are the things that you can go back to. Um, but for demonstration purposes, I'm going to commit this now. And it's going to be um, generated readme file. So we've committed this. And so you can check um, your commits by using the git log. Um, if you type git log and, and hit enter, there's a lot of um, information that gets outputted. But so I usually like doing a one line. And so it'll tell you, it'll give you the hash number. These hash numbers are what allow you to revert back to previous snapshots. So it'll give you the hash number and it'll give you the commit message. And this is why your commit messages should be very specific because in the future, if you wanna go back to a certain snapshot, th this is the information that you have. Another thing that you can do with the git log command is you can see the changes that were made. So if you do git log and you pass in a, a, a dash P and then do a one line as well, right? You can see here that the difference is that we generated this readme file and we added the plus sign means we added the sentence. This is a git tutorial. So if we made the change, if you make a deletion, it'll show up in red with a minus sign. And if you make additions, it'll show up in green. And so you can track between your commits, what has been added and what has been removed from any certain file that you are tracking with Git. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I wanna re return to the other branch, right? So right now our directory is background code data readme. We've generated this readme file and we have the results. Now, if we check out our main branch again, and we do an ls to look at the directory, you can see that we don't have that readme file because that's uh, exclusive to the uh, second branch that we created, which I can't remember what I call um, the test branch. And so now we're happy with our, um, let's say we're happy with our readme file. It's ready for production. It's ready to be uh, made available to the masses, um, you wanna merge your changes into the main branch. Now what's tricky with the merge, and you know, I've, I'm, I've been talking more than using this flow chart, but everything that I'm talking about is here. And I've put these in, in, an, in a very logical, well, the, the most logical order that I could think of. And so now we're in the merging slide. Um, so the only thing you need to, remember when you merge branches is you always merge into the branch that you have checked out. So if we want to merge our changes that were made in tests, we need to check out main first and then merge. So otherwise, if you're in test and you merge, you would merge main into test. But the, the command is straightforward. It's git merge and then the branch name that you want to merge. And we know we've checked out main over here. And so now we can do the git merge. And so it tells you that it merged using the fast forward method and it merged a readme file with one line in it, one insertion. And so now if we look at the directory, we have this readme file. Another thing that the git log can show you is if you do the graph option, and one line as well. It shows you, well, I guess this, this didn't pop out the way that I wanted it to, but it should show you um, the, the merged branch. Um, and I think this is because we have a fast forward merge instead of a, a three-way merge. But if you have a three-way merge, which is a different type of merge that occurs when uh, it's not just that a file was added, but there were changes made to files within the main. Uh, the graph option will show you uh, how your uh, directories start merged on the left-hand side over here where the asterisks are. Okay, so let's go back here. So we've talked about branching. Staging is putting things into the box before taking a snapshot. Committing is taking the snapshot. And then merging uh, is to merge um, completed branches into main. 
And then we, we, we can push our changes to a, a, a remote repository such as GitHub or GitLab or any other remote repository that exists. And to push, uh, I've got the command here. Uh, this is something that I'd like you guys to try on your own um, in the, in the uh, 45 minutes at the end of the lecture. And I'll help people um, with setting because you would have to sync a remote. And I, I wanna walk around helping people with this because this is the most challenging part of this tutorial is if you haven't done this, um, but you only have to do it one time, luckily. Um, and so we've, talk, we've talked about logs and some of the options that the logs can give you so that you can uh, look back at the history of your project. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about um, these red areas, the made a mistake areas. Um, and so let's talk about uh, if you made a, a commit error, you, you've taken a snapshot that you don't want anymore, what do you do? And so to do that, let's look at um, let's make some changes to that readme file. And so we can add another sentence here. And we, we can call this this a sentence. And we save it. And then we can go through our process of putting it in the box. And then committing it. So now we can we can open up our git log again here. And we've made this commit over here. And you can see that our head is pointing to main. Um, and so we've made this commit, but we don't want this commit any longer. But what we what we don't want to do is we don't want uh, to uh, erase history. And so you can think of this log as history. So we want to revert back to this uh, commit here using this ID without erasing our history. So we want to uh, be able to look back and see that we've made this error that we don't want. And so the way you would do this is with a git revert. You would do git revert and then you would paste, oops, if it copied it, but it didn't copy it. So I'm going to type this F6 BDED8. And let me go to the right. Okay. So git revert and then the SHA1 hash number. Um, let me go back here. And so when you execute this, it tells you that there's a conflict and that you would have to resolve the conflict before you can revert the file, um, which is unexpected to be honest. Uh, oh, I, I see, okay. And so that's because we've, we've merged through this uh, second branch. So let me, let me add another line just for demonstration purposes. Um, I, I, I know what happened. I, I put in the wrong hash number. Okay, so I want to revert my last commit. And so when I do this, it'll tell you to enter a message. And the default one is, is perfectly fine. So the, the default message is that we're reverting and it gives the message that you input for the commit. And then it tells you this reverts this hash. And so this is the full hash of the commit. And so you can save this and exit. And so now if we do a git log, you can see that the last commits message is revert added sentence three to readme. So we've reverted this. 
And so now if we open up our nano file, or if we look at the readme without opening up the nano, you can see that we have sentence two in here, but we don't have sentence three because we've reverted that commit. So now I wanna talk about um, what if you do wanna erase history, right? So we've made this commit here and let's, let's assume that this commit had uh, uh, sensitive information, sensitive data was committed and we don't want to push that. Uh, and we don't want that to be in the history because if, you, if it's in the history, then you can grab the files that were a part of that commit. Uh, to do that, you would use the git reset command and you can do a git reset uh, and you would pass in the hard uh, modifier, which means it will delete um, uh, the, the files and the, and the commit. Oh, why isn't this? Okay. <laughs> All right, so now the message is that head is at 91751.9. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Keep getting the wrong message. I'm sorry, 666C1CA. Okay, so now if I do git log one line, oops. Right, you can see that we're now at the added three sentences to read me. And you can see that this revert message or this entire revert commit is no longer in existence. So it's not in the history, which means that anything that was in this box that you took a snapshot of no longer exists and you can no longer get to it. But it also means that if there were sensitive information in there, it's, it's not accessible to anyone any longer. And now if we take a look at our, um, readme file, we should be back to three sentences. So this is sentence number three. And so we've, we've, done, uh, two different, we've done two different ways of uh, fixing errors. The first is when you don't have a commit that has sensitive information, you can, it is um, beneficial and, and usually um, uh, it, it will be beneficial to you and everyone on the project to use the, the revert method to ensure that um, that change is rec recorded in history. Um, if there is sensitive information, then you would use the reset with the hard um, uh, parameter um, for the reset command. And then there is one more, and that is to, um, it's called the restore. And, that's, and this is usually uh, used for individual files. So what we can do is, let me, Go to the appropriate slide. Okay. And so we, we have this readme file right now and we have the three sentences which corresponds to this commit over here. Uh, let's say we wanna re revert this to the two sentences. Um, the way that you would do that is you would do a git restore and then you would do the readme.md but you have to give it the source, which is the D8, D03, E9. And so now if we look at the readme file, we can see that we're back to having two sentences because we've restored the file from this box. We've pulled the file from that box. But if you do get status, you can see that get is telling you that this file has been modified because it's different than the very last commit because we pulled that file from a previous commit. And so these are the three ways for you to revert back um, if you've made um, an error or if you wanna recover a file um, or if you wanna um, um, erase from history an event of um, committing uh, anything that's sensitive and you don't want to have that committed in your local, local or remote repository. Um, so now I want to, I want to stop for a second and see if anyone has questions before I move on to the Python section. Okay, I'm going to assume everything is is clear and 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 it makes sense. Okay, perfect. Um, 
So let's move into the Python section. Um, let me, uh, I provide slides, but you don't really need, th these are just five slides, so I'll walk through this. Um, oh no, I closed the slide though. <laughs> Okay, so I want to talk about virtual environments. And this is something uh, in this course, it's specific to Python, but this is something that's available in most programming languages. Uh, it's available in R. Um, if you use R, you can, you can find um, an equivalent to this. Um, but the reasoning for using a virtual environment is that you start uh, from an environment with no software dependencies, and then you install the dependencies that you want, and then you lock you generate a lock file, which which uh, which keeps in its history the exact versions of these packages that you used, so that in the future, whenever you want to run any of your um, old analyses or old software, you will use the same packages that you had the same version of the packages that you used when you developed the analysis or the software, etc. Because a lot of packages um, at some point stop being updated. And then uh, other uh, more uh, popular packages keep getting updated. And then these packages depend on one another. And so the package that wasn't being updated uses an old version of the popular package that gets updated. And so now the code doesn't work. And so then you have to go into source code or you have to start installing different versions of R or Python or trying to get the older version that you had used if you remember what version it was on when you were developing the analysis. And this is why we use virtual environments. And in Python, you would first install the virtual environment tool, which is called pip env. And then it's very easy to generate a, a virtual environment. All you would have to do, and there are multiple ways to do this, you can do a pip env and start installing your packages one by one, or you can put all of the package dependencies in a text file and do a pip env install dash r, and it'll install all of those packages that you have in the requirement folder, uh, text file. And then to activate your virtual environment, you would use a pip env shell, and then exit to exit the environment. So I'm gonna show some of this here. So right now, uh, I'm in, the, in VS code, and I have the notebook that is available on GitHub open. And you can see, um, that I am in the directory um, of my analysis. And you can see that in terminal, it says base over here. And that means that I'm not in any virtual environment. Um, to enter a virtual environment, the command was pip env shell. And so now you can see in parentheses over here, that I'm in the virtual environment that I've generated in this working directory. And once I'm in this uh, virtual environment, you can see the packages that I've installed here. So these are the packages that are installed and, and locked to this virtual environment. And so when, whenever I um, enter this virtual environment or whenever I share these virtual environment um, files with individuals and they start the virtual environment, they are also using the same package dependencies. Does, do any people, do, does anyone have any questions about virtual environments? Does, does it make sense why we use them? Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna start walking through some of the, the Python um, and then, uh, I'll let you guys, I, I, I grabbed a couple of data sets from Kaggle uh, and then I'll, uh, I will let you guys, you know, generate your file structure, initialize Git, and then um, maybe plot out a, a few figures using, using Python. Um, and so in, Git, in Python, if, if people are new to Python, um, in order to load a package, um, uh, similar to how you would load a package in R using the library method or the library function. In, in Python, you would use the import statement. And what you can do is you can import them and you can assign them to 
um, shorthand uh, letters or um, shorthand, um, what's the word? I can't remember the word, um, but you, you can assign a, the package to a, a shorter um, description so that you can um, access the methods and the objects of that uh, class. And I'll talk more about this as well. And so what we're doing here is we're um, importing uh, a package in Python that's called pandas. And pandas is, uh, I'd say, the equivalent of dplyr in, in, the, in R. Um, and then we're pulling Plotly, which is available in R and available in multiple programming languages. Uh, Plotly is a, uh, is a um, figure generating software that, is, that generates interactive figures and plots. And so we're going to walk through these here in a, in a second. Um, let me run through this. Okay. And so uh, I'm going to be using a global temperature, global land temperature data set. Uh, and this is a really large data set. Um, I had to zip, zip it to, to push it onto Git and onto GitHub because they have a 100 megabyte size uh, cap. Um, and so once you, if you download it, you're going to have to unzip it before running through this uh, uh, notebook. And so uh, pandas has a uh, function to read in CSVs and it's, it's the read underscore CSV method. And what I've done is I've, I've put in a link here um, that shows you uh, different file formats that you can read into a, a, a tabular data frame. And so you can read from your clipboard, so you can copy and paste things into a data frame, Excel, a JSON file, HTML. And so you can go through this and find the correct method for the data that you would like to read into Python using pandas. Um, and then, uh, so the way that uh, Python works is you get uh, things that are called objects made from classes. And so you can think of an object um, similar to um, for example, an, an employee who would have a first name and a last name, and then they'd have a salary. So all employees would have these things. And so these would be called the attributes of the object. And the way that you would call an attribute in Python is you would use the dot notation, and then you would call the attributes name without any parentheses. And you can see that the data frame, so we read the data into, into this, uh, we called it a data variable and we read the data frame into this data variable. And so now this data variable is an object of a class of pandas data frame. And so these objects have uh, attributes and they have classes and attributes are, as I said, um, in, inherent to all of this objects type, um, such as an employee who would have a first name, a last name, um, an email address, a phone number. And so, uh, and you can see that th this is a head method. And so we, uh, using the dot notation, we've, um, we've called this head method, which shows you the first five rows of this um, data set. But then this here is an attribute. And so every data frame has a shape. It has a number of rows and has a number of columns. And so this shape attribute uh, lists the number of rows. And we have a little bit over 8 million in this data set and then list the number of columns. And so we have seven columns. Uh, another attribute is the, is the columns attribute, and it gives you the names of the columns in the data set. Uh, another one would be the D types attribute, and it tells you what, what is the type of the data, uh, what is the, the type of, the, of your columns uh, within your data set. And so we can see that we have some float 64 um, numeric types, and then we have uh, these object types that are uh, designated as uh, for string objects. And so you can see that these are strings over here and the latitude and longitude are strings because of the, uh, the north and east designation after the, the numerical, numerical values. Um, and I, I believe I've provided a link for, yep, I provided a link here that has um, a list of pandas uh, data frame object attributes and methods. And so you can go in here and take a look if, if, if there's anything that you're trying to figure out um, uh, to pull from that object. 
Um, so how do we um, subset our data and, and take a look at it and, and using pandas is you would um, supplement the object with a list of the columns if you want to uh, pull out any particular column. And so here you can see that we generate a list um, and we pass it these three column names. And then we pass the list into uh, our object and uh, within these um, brackets. And so you can see that after um, subsetting the data, we call the head method and we print out the five first rows. You don't have to do this two-step thing. You can, you can immediately copy and paste this inside of the um, square brackets and it will work. So whichever way you'd prefer. And then if you wanna slice the data set in, in different ways, then you can use the iloc method. And this will, for example, we can see that our first um, item within the brackets are the range of the number of rows that we'd like to pull out. And then the, the second item is the range of the number of columns. And a, and a colon means that we want all of the col uh, columns. Uh, here, what we're saying is we want to take the 30th uh, row, which is really the 31st because Python indexes at, at zero. So we want to take the 31st row, go to the 42nd and not include the 42nd. Uh, that was a horrible way to explain this. Um, but what this is saying is that we take, uh, we go from 30 to 41, not including 41. And this is what it'll return. Uh, keeping in mind that pan, uh, the first row is row zero. Okay, so it's very important when you start working with um, a data set to make sure that you convert your data types into logical, uh, uh, logical types so that when you uh, move through your analysis, things are in the correct format. And so when you pass in uh, a value or a vector into a function, you know that uh, what you're passing is the correct type. And so pandas has a few ways to start con to convert these types. And so the first thing we wanna convert is uh, this datetime field, this datetime column. We'd like it to be a date, uh, class, uh, date uh, type. And so the way you would do that is you would use um, the function from pandas called to date time. And what we're doing here is we're saying uh, for the data object, and, and we want to pull the date time uh, vector, and then we want to assign to it uh, the same vector converted to a date time using this to date time function. And then once we do that, you can see that we've now converted our date time column into a date time uh, object. Um, and please stop me if anything doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm going to run through this stuff as well because this is a very similar. We're just using a categorical converter over here to convert the city and country to get categorical types. Um, let me walk people through this a little bit more. So let me run through these cells real quickly. Um, I think I ran that. So. Okay, so over here, what I'd like to do is to convert the latitude and longitude uh, columns to float, to numerical floats. But we, we know there's an issue because the latitude and longitude um, columns had these uh, N and E for north and east and south and, uh, south and west. But we also know that on the map, north and east are positive and then south and west are negative. And so, what we're doing over here is we're splitting up that field um, using regular expression to separate the numerical, va numerical value from the um, letter at the end of the value. And so I'm gonna run, run this and then I'll, I'll break down the code so that uh, it makes more sense. And then what's happening uh, in the bottom two lines is that we're using a for loop. And so Python has a shorthand, uh, it has a shorthand uh, way to write for loops. And this is just the shorthand way. And I'll run through this as well. 
Okay, so this has, we ran this now. And so let's take a look at what this looks like. So we can see that what the regular expression did to that to the to the values in that column. And so what's happening here is we we're pulling the values of latitude. And then we're saying that we want to use a string method, which is the split method. And we want to split uh, at the very end of the digit. This is what the regular expression is saying. And so you, what you can see here is that at the very end of the digit, we're splitting. And then the regular expression also says to split at the very last character. And then now we have a list over here, um, or, or what is called a series in pandas of these um, uh, arrays of value letter. Uh, what we want to do next, so what this code does here is um, it returns the float of, okay, let me break this down a little bit. Uh, so over here, what we're saying is we're assigning x um, values of the iterable split latitude. And what is an iterable? An iterable is an item that has many uh, repeating elements. So if you look at split latitude, you can see that uh, this element repeats. So we have multiple rows of, of an element. And so each element is being assigned to X. So split latitude is an iterable and we're assigning uh, sequentially each uh, item to X. And so now, and then what we're doing is we're taking at the end, we're taking, an, we're taking X zero. And so if we index this to be the first item, we're taking the first item of the iterable. So this is equivalent to X. And then what we're doing is we're taking the first item within X, which is the value. And here, okay. here what we're doing is we're turning it into a float. And so what we're saying is if X one, so if I pull X one, remember that split latitude zero is equivalent to X. If I pull X one, we're getting the letter. So what I'm saying is if X one, so this is equivalent to X one. If X one is equal to N, then I wanna take the float of X. But if X one isn't, equal to n, then I want to multiply it by negative one, because if it's not n, it's s for south. And we know that south values would be negative. Um, and so uh, let, me, let me kind of demo um, the, so in Python, uh, we can, uh, uh, this is called a list iterable. Uh, and the, the very first item in the list iterable is what you want to return. So here we're saying we want to return X, but we don't know what X is because we haven't defined it, but X should be an iterable. And so we would say for X in some iter. And so if, if you do, for example, if we go one, two, three, this is a list in Python. Uh, a list is an iterable because it has multiple elements within it. And so what this means is that sequentially X is going to take on the value of one followed by a value of two followed by a value of three. And what, what this list of uh, comprehension is going to output is this X value because that's what we tell it. So if we run this, we can see that it outputs the, the iterable X. Um, I hope this, does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so th this is what that code does. What it, it's doing is it's converting the latitude and the longitude to float uh, types uh, by pulling out, pulling out the last character. If it's north, it's gonna be positive. And if it's south, it's negative to um, reflect where it is uh, on the map. All right, so now Pandas has a method called describe and describe gives you summary statistics, so descriptive statistics about the, um, the columns within your data frame. And so if you run this, you would get, uh, you would get the count, how many are unique for categorical variables. So we can, you can see that we have 3,448 cities 
that are unique. Um, what's the largest count? So Springfield was the largest uh, count within the cities. India had the most records for country. And then you, would, you can see the minimum date. This, so the earliest time point, uh, the last time point we have in the data set. And then you can see the, some statistics of distribution for the float values, the average temperature. And so this is a, a quick way to generate um, uh, descriptive statistics on your data set. And then a different method is called the info method. And what this tells you, it gives you the type of your columns and it tells you how many are non-null. So it tells you that you have this many rows, so almost 8.6 million. And then what you can see is that we have some missing values for average temperature and then the average temperature uncertainty. Okay. So next is to generate some plots. And so I've included a link to the gallery for Plotly. Um, and so you can go to this link and you can find a bunch of different um, figures that you'd be interested in, in, in using. Uh, Plotly has uh, two modules. It has its PX module, which is Plotly Express. And this is a module that is made, uh, that makes it very user-friendly to generate plots. Um, so if, if you want to generate a plot and you want to do it quickly, I would recommend using the Plotly Express um, module within Plotly. It also has another module called the, um, the graph object module. That is a little bit more, um, uh, so not user friendly, but that gives you more control over your figure. And so you can add multiple traces and you can control your figure um, in, in more detail. So let me walk through these, these um, figures a little bit. Um, so the first thing that we're doing here is that we're subsetting, so we're filtering our data set. And what we're doing is we're saying that we want to take the data, the country column within our data set, and we want to return the rows that uh, contain either Denmark or Lebanon. So what this is saying is that uh, what countries within this country column are in, is in, Denmark or Lebanon. And so this, this is being um, stored as box data. And then from Plotly Express, there's the box method where you give it the data set and then the, you give it your Y for the average, temp we're, we're plotting average temperature. And then you would give it the color as your grouping category over here. And then if you, if you want the points on, on the side, you can specify that. The default is not to have the points. And then you can give it a title. And then uh, this is very quick and very easy to generate a, a box plot. Okay. Uh, the next part I wanted to show is, is line data, uh, how to plot this line data. And, and what I really want to show is how to um, wrangle the data set because plotting the data is, is very straightforward. But what we're doing, what we're doing here is again, we're filtering our data set. So we're saying we want to take the, the country where the record value is Brazil. And then what we're saying is we're chaining uh, this method here, which is called resample. What this is doing is it's resampling on the date time uh, column. And that's why we converted it to a date time. And what it's saying is that group these records by year. And so we're grouping the, all of the records by year and then we're selecting the average temperature and then we ta we're taking the average of that, we're taking the mean. And so we're taking the mean of the average temperature grouped by year. And so it becomes a yearly average average temperature. And then what we're doing is, is very easily, we're passing in the data set, we're passing in our value for X and Y, and then we're giving it a title. And then anything that you wanna customize on your figure goes in the uh, update layout method of your figure object. And so we can change the X axis title and then the Y axis title because the default would have been DT. And you can see that some weird stuff is happening in Brazil uh, in terms of temperature. And I guess there's some missing data as well.
Okay, so now the final figure I wanna walk people through is a graph object figure. And you can see immediately that the, the code is much longer because uh, you have to add in the traces, uh, but it does offer more flexibility to generate a figure. And so what we're doing here, and I'm gonna uh, walk through really the, the wrangling of the data, which is more important than the figure. Um, but if you can, you can uh, if you start with parentheses, you can put all of your code in a neat way where you can chain your methods one after the other, and, uh, and we can walk through this. So the first line over here, we're filtering the data. So we're selecting um, um, the country column where the record is United States and where the daytime column, the year of the daytime column is greater than 2008. So here you can see we selected the date time column because it's a date time object because we converted it. We can call the date time uh, method and we can say that we want to extract the year from each one of those uh, records. And then we want to make sure that they're greater than 2008. So first line is we are uh, filtering our data set. Uh, the second line is we're setting the index to be the date time. And so what this does is uh, we're, we're making the row names of the data set the date time. And I'll, and I'll talk about why we do this. After we do that, we're grouping our data set by country, city, latitude, and longitude. So I'm grouping the data. So for every country, city, latitude, and longitude, the records are grouped together. And then what we do is for that grouping, we also group the time. And that's why we set the index to the date time. So for the group of country, city, latitude, and longitude, we also group that group by the year. And then we extract the average temperature and then we take the mean. So what, what is this doing? It, we're taking um, every, uh, every uh, city within the United States that we have, we're grouping it by the latitude and longitude. And then we're taking the average of the average yearly. So we're taking a, a yearly average of the temperature. And then uh, you, we initialize our, our graph object using the go.figure statement. And then what we do is we add a trace. So you can add multiple traces to graph objects and you can keep drawing things on top of things. And so here the trace is a scatter geo. Uh, and so I define the layout of the geo to be the map of the United States. This is the first argument. Then I pass in the longitude and uh, values. And here I further filter to the year of 2009 because this graph object uh, only shows you one slice in time. The one beneath it that I've added as a bonus uh, is an animated graph object that will play through multiple years of time. Um, and I, I, uh, you, I will be happy to, if, you, if people want to take a look at that on their own and send an email, I'll be happy to help people with that. But I really want you guys to start um, trying to implement these things. Uh, so the longitude, the latitude, the text is what the hover text will look like. And this is a, a you can implement HTML in here. So this is a break. So it means that there's a line break between the city value and the average temperature. And then here you can add some uh, marker um, uh, attributes. And so you can define how big the, the circle is, what, what is the color and things like that. And then in the update layout, you can update, as we said previously, the text and the legend and uh, the color and things that uh, have to do with the, with the uh, layout of the figure. And so this generates this plot over here. And so you can, you can see um, that there's that line break between the city and the average temperature. Um, and, and just so that everyone knows, there is a plotly express version of doing this and it's much easier, but I just wanted to show a graph object um, module uh, figure as well. And so this is the result of that. And then on your own, because this is really long code, uh, but what it generates is this animated figure where you can scrub through the years and you can look at the differences in, in temperatures. Okay, um, 
I'm going to, end, uh, first, does anyone have any questions? Okay, I'm gonna end the workshop lecture type thing here and I'm gonna stop recording.